What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and today, I'm here to discuss with you the repercussions of the ramifications of the ha ha ha, fuck it, UFC on Fox 5. Fight gloves are on, predictions are coming your way, headlined by a battle for the lightweight championship and pivotal matchups in the welterweight and light heavyweight divisions. Let's do this. We're going to start on the prelim card in the lightweight division. We have Tim Means taking on Abel Triillo. Uh, Tim Means, 18-3-1 on his pro career, a perfect 2-0 in the UFC. Means currently riding an 11-fight win streak, including a TKO over Justin Salas and a decision win over Bernardo Magalesh inside the UFC. 13 of his 18 wins have come by way of knockout, He but he has been submitted in two of his three losses. Uh, has a notable loss to Spencer Fisher back in 2005, a former King of the Cage lightweight and junior welterweight champion. Uh, Abel Triillo, 9-4 on his pro career, making his UFC debut. Currently riding a four-fight win streak, three of those four wins coming by way of decision. Five of his nine wins have been finishes. He's got two knockouts and three submissions. However, three of his four losses have also been finishes. finishes sorry, He's been knocked out once and submitted twice. Uh, Triello trains with the Black Zillions. He's considered to be a very explosive fighter, and watching a couple of his fights, I guess I'd probably have to agree with that. He is pretty explosive. Honestly, i got to go with Tim Means here. He's got the edge in experience, the edge in UFC experience. He's got more of a a sort of a finishing pedigree here. Very dangerous standing up. Triillo's only chance here is going to be to get this fight to the ground and try to submit him. I don't think it's going to happen. If Means keeps this thing standing, Tim Means all day. I will take Tim Means to beat Abel Triillo by second round knockout or TKO. Bantamweight division, we have Scott Jorgensen taking on John Albert. Scott Jorgensen, 13-6 and six on his pro career, an even record of 2-2 two and two inside the UFC. Currently riding a two-fight losing streak to both Eddie Wineland and the current interim bantamweight champion, Henan Barrow. Uh, he's a former top contender at this weight class. Uh, he's got notable wins on his career over Takeya Mitsuzaki, um, uh, Banuelos, as well as One Punch Pickett. Uh, He's been 2-2 two two since that loss to Dominic Cruz. Again, he fought Dominic Cruz for, at the time, the WEC uh, Bantamweight Championship, which would then, of course, become the UFC Bantamweight Championship, and, of course, lost that fight. Former Div 1 wrestler and a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I really like Scott Jorgensen. Uh, John Albert, 7-3 and three on his pro career, a losing record of 1-2 and two in the octagon. Also currently riding a two-loss streak to Eric Perez and Ivan Menjavar. All seven of his wins have been finishes. He's got four knockouts and three submissions, so he's dangerous anywhere the fight goes. But he has been submitted in all three of his losses. Uh, he won his first six professional fights, but he's only one in three in his last four. So Albert's kind of hit hard times as he's stepped up in competition. Uh, he's attempted five submissions in his three fights, so he's good to attempt at least one, if not two, submissions a fight. Uh, what I find about Albert from watching a couple of his fights, he lacks real great movement. I know his his strikes, his incoming strikes avoided, I believe, is under 50% on his career. So he just he just he lacks real great sort of avoidance of of incoming strikes. And I expect Jorgensen's going to attempt to keep this thing on the feet, and he's going to try to outstrike Albert. I think he will. I'm going to take Scott Jorgensen to finish the fight by knockout or technical knockout inside the third and final round. Back to the lightweight division, we have Darren Cruikshank taking on Henry Martinez. Uh, Cruikshank, 11-2 on his pro career, won his only UFC fight. Uh, that was against Chris Tickle. <laughs> Tickle. Won that fight by decision, currently riding a five-fight win streak. Six of his 11 pro wins have been knockouts. He's been finished in both losses, knocked out once, and submitted once. Uh, former Div 3 wrestler, for what that's worth, I mean, when I was down in Maine, I went to a Div 3 school, and our wrestling team fucking sucked. So, I mean, he was, again, Div 3 wrestler, but who knows what that's worth. Uh, he has losses on his career to Strike Force alumni Bobby Green and Bellator alumni Luis Palomino. Uh, Henry Martinez, 9-2 and two on his pro career, an even record of 1-1 one and one in the UFC. Decisioned Bernardo Magalesh in his last fight. Uh, he's fought on his career at different points between featherweight as high up as welterweight, fighting this fight, of course, at light. Uh, trains with Jackson's MMA in New Mexico. Uh, six of his nine wins have been finishes. He's got two knockouts and four subs. 
but he's been decisioned in both of his losses. Uh, if Cruikshank can really effectively use his wrestling here, I think he can probably grind out a decision. I don't think he's going to be able to effectively use that wrestling, because like I say, former Div 3 wrestler, and from the l bit of Cruikshank's wrestling that I've seen, like... It's okay. It's not great. So I think Henry Martinez is going to be able to keep this thing standing. I actually expect this to be a relatively boring fight, but I'm going to take Henry Martinez just based on what I, f I feel having the superior overall skill set. I'll take Henry Martinez to beat Darren Cruikshank by way of unanimous judge's decision. Sticking with lightweight, we have Eve Edwards taking on Jeremy Stevens, pending that no more law enforcement agencies have a petty grudge against Jeremy Stevens this week. Uh, Eve Edwards, 41-18-1 on his pro career. This is all probably going to sound very, very familiar from what I've talked about before. 8-7 uh, and seven in the UFC, was decisioned in his last fight by Tony Ferguson. Uh, he's got notable wins on his career over Pete Spratt, Rich Clemente, Josh Thompson, Luis Palomino, and Cody McKenzie. And in that fight, of course, he won submission of the night and fight of the night for that fight against Cody McKenzie and Rafaelo Oliveira. 32 of his 41 pro wins have been finishes. He's got 15 knockouts and 17 submissions, so he's very, very well balanced. A dangerous fighter. And 10 of his 18 pro losses have come by way of decision. Jeremy Stevens, 20 and 8 on his pro career, an even record of 7 and 7 in the UFC. So these are guys who, between them, have 29 UFC fights. A lot of experience. Uh, currently riding a two loss streak, but it's to cream of the crop in this division Donald Cowboy Cerrone and Anthony Showtime Pettis. Uh, 14 of his 20 pro wins have been knockouts. He is 3 and 5 in decisions, so less than 50% have gone his way. Uh, he's subbed three people and he's been submitted three times. He has never been knocked out on his pro career. Uh, BJJ Black Belt trains with Alliance MMA. I, I kind of got a soft spot for Jeremy Stevens. I like the way that the dude fights and with this whole uh, law situation I know springing from an assault from 2010 or 2011 or something. Uh, you know I felt like he really got the short end of the stick last time. I like him as a fighter. Maybe some people might consider this an upset because Eve Edwards definitely does have the experience edge in this fight. 60 fights to 28, so double the actual fight experience. I'm going to take Jeremy Stevens here. I think he's... I don't know. I just think Stevens is more dangerous, certainly on the feet. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to take Jeremy Stevens, but I'm going to take it by unanimous judge's decision. I'll give Eve Edwards enough respect that I don't think he'll finish him. Sticking with the lightweights, we've got a lot of lightweight fights on this card, although this is the last one. We have Ramsey Nijem taking on Joe Proctor. Ramsey Nijem, 6-2 on his pro career. He is 2-1 and one in the UFC. Currently riding a two-fight win streak over CJ Keith and Danny Downs. Uh, he's got an even win distribution. He's got two knockouts, two submissions, two decisions. Uh, he's been finished in both of his losses, knocked out once and submitted the other time. Uh, trains at the pit, elevated. Nijem hits, about, hits a little over 50% of his takedown attempts. The big thing here for Nijem, he only defends one in three. His defense is only about 33%. So was it just a was it a reflection of fighting people that's got good takedown offense, or is it just that his defense when it comes to takedowns may be a little suspect? Uh, looking at Joe Proctor, 8-1 and one on his pro career, won his UFC debut by TKOing Jeremy Larson, riding a four-fight win streak. Uh, four of his eight pro wins have been submissions. He was knocked out in his only loss. Uh, he's 3-0 when the fight goes the distance. Currently trains with Team Aggression. And in the Larson fight, he did not attempt a takedown. So, my, my concern here is, is Joe Proctor going to have the takedown offense that he can take Nijem down and he can sort of grind out a decision? I don't know. He is undefeated when the fight goes the distance, but Nijem is a very good wrestler. I think i got to take Ramsey Nijem here, and I don't think it's going to be all that exciting of a fight. I'll take Ramsey Nijem to beat Joe Proctor by way of unanimous judge's decision. Cruising right along, down to the featherweights. Dennis Seaver taking on Nam Fan. Dennis Seaver, 20-8 and eight on his pro career, a good record of 9-5 and five inside the octagon. He decisioned Diego Nunez in his last fight. That was in his featherweight debut. He's been submitted in five of his eight professional losses. That's something to work, up, to, uh, work on and look out for. 14 of his 20 wins, though, have been finishes. Five knockouts and a surprising nine submissions. I didn't think Dennis Seaver had that many. 
Uh, he's six and two when the fight goes the distance. Very well-rounded fighter. Uh, he's a kickboxer. He's a samboist. Uh, he's got taekwondo in his game. He's a judoist. He's a BJJ purple belt. He's got a black belt in taekwondo. Uh, and he avoids around 70% of incoming strikes. So only about 30% of his opponent's incoming strikes are actually hitting him. And at featherweight, I did notice Dennis Seaver appears to be a lot faster, both with his own hand speed and with avoiding strikes. You like my little, like my little movements there? Uh, Nam Fan. 18 and 10 on his pro career, got a lot of fight experience. Uh, 2 and 3 in the octagon, he decisioned Cole Miller in his last fight. Uh, 12 of his 18 wins have been finishes. He's got 7 knockouts and 5 submissions, so very well-rounded in his own right. 6 and 7 when the fight goes the distance. Uh, Nam Fan's a former pro boxer. Uh, he's a, got black belts in both BJJ and karate. He's a brown belt in judo, and he's a second-degree black belt in Vietnamese Kuyin Dao, which is, I think the way he uses it is it's more of a striking style than anything else. Fan is a very active striker. He he throws he does he throws a lot of strikes and that's a lot due to his boxing background I'm sure. My big question in this fight is can Nam Fan catch Dennis Seaver and can he actually make enough of those strikes count that he can hurt Seaver and finish him? I don't think so. I think Seaver's got the speed advantage here. I think he's actually got the striking advantage. He's going to be able to avoid a lot more strikes, land a lot more strikes on his own. I will take Dennis Seaver to win this fight over Nam Fan again by way of unanimous judges' decision because I didn't want to. Get fan sort of the disrespect quote unquote that he'll finish him so I'll take it by decision and the last fight on the prelim card at bantamweight we have Rafael Asuncao taking on Mike Easton uh, Rafael Asuncao 17 and 4 on his pro career he is 2 and 1 in the UFC currently riding a two fight win streak over Issei Tamora and Johnny Eduardo it's kind of been hit and miss since 2009 but all four of his professional losses have been against high-level competition. You're talking Jeff Curran, uh, Uriah Faber, Diego Nunez, and Eric Koch. All four of those guys are high-level competition. He is undefeated at this weight class. 11 of his 17 pro wins have been finishes, three knockouts, and eight submissions. Certainly has more of the pedigree of a grappler than a striker. Taking on Mike Easton, 13-1 and on his pro career, an undefeated 3-0 and in the UFC. Currently riding an 8-fight win streak, which includes decision win over Ivan Menjivar, decision win over Jared Papazian, and a TKO of Byron Bloodworth in his three UFC fights. He's got notable wins outside the UFC as well. You're talking Chase Beebe and John Dodson, and both of those fights again outside of the UFC. Seven of his 13 pro wins have been decisions. He's got good takedown defense. He throws a lot of strikes. He's very active, and he's very fast. Um, this is actually a high-level fight at bantamweight. This is actually, I think, going to be a really exciting fight. I think this is going to be an exciting fight that, again, is going to go all three rounds. And I think Mike Easton is probably going to sneak it out. I want to, I kind of wanted to say split decision here because I was very, very close on both of these guys. I'll take Mike Easton by way of unanimous judge's decision. All right, kids, it's main card time. In the welterweight division, we have Mike Quick Swick taking on Matt Brown. Mike Swick is 15-4 and four on his pro career, 10-3 and three inside the UFC. Knocked out to Marcus Johnson in his last fight, which snapped a two-loss streak to Paulo Tiago and Dan Hardy. He's got other notable UFC wins. David Luazo, Marcus Davis, Ben Saunders. Not exactly high-level competition, but good competition all the same, especially Ben Saunders. Ben Saunders is my boy, follows me on Twitter. Eight of his 15 pro wins have been knockouts, four and two when the fight goes the distance. He is eight of 15 on his takedowns versus uh, Brown's takedown defense, which is around 65%. So that's something that I'm going to watch out for, a guy that hits the majority of his takedowns versus a guy that defends against the majority of takedowns. The takedown battle and the clinch battle here could be really, really interesting. Matt Brown, 15 and 11 on his pro career, 8 and 5 in the UFC, but is riding a three-fight win streak over Luis Ramos, Stephen Thompson, and Chris Cope. All of them have been impressive wins. 13 of his 15 pro wins have been finishes, 8 knocks, and 5 subs. However, he's got no submissions since 2008, but has been submitted in 9 of his 11 pro losses. Matt Brown is susceptible on the ground, despite that 5 submission number. He is susceptible on the ground. 9 of 11 submission losses, you can't really argue with that. 2-2 two and two when the fight goes the distance. Matt Brown is known for having an iron 
chin. Matt Brown can take some shots, and I think Swick is going to deliver some shots. Uh, he's a Judo Brown belt. He's a BJJ Purple belt. And uh, his clinch striking is very good, and that's why I mentioned the clinch thing when I was talking about Mike Swick. Uh, if Mike Swick is unsuccessful on his takedowns, there's going to be a lot of clinch striking, I believe, in this fight, which lends an advantage to Matt Brown. I think Swick is going to be able to hit a couple of takedowns in this fight, ideally be able to control things from the top. I don't think Matt Brown is all that dangerous off his back with his submissions. It's something that we haven't overly seen from him on his career. I'm going to take Mike Swick here. I'm going to take Mike Swick to beat Matt Brown by way of unanimous judges' decision and move up the ladder in the welterweight division. Sticking with welterweight and the first in what I would consider almost a triple main event on this card. This, the top end of this card is phenomenal. We're talking about the prodigy, BJ Penn, coming back from retirement to answer the challenge of a young gun, Rory McDonald. Penn, 16, 8, and 2 on his pro career. 12, 7, and 2 in the UFC. So the majority of his career, of course, fought in the octagon. He is a UFC legend. He was decisioned by Nick Diaz in his last fight. His last win was the knockout of Matt Hughes in late 2010, that spectacular knockout. Uh, it's his first fight in over a year, but he's a BJJ black belt under Andre uh, Peder Peder Pedernarius, I want to say. Um, he's, a, he's a student of Carlson Gracie. Uh, you're talking about that Nova Uniao camp. The BJJ is a big part of that camp. He's 3-6 and six when the fight goes the distance, and I have to wonder, uh, what does BJ Penn want to do in this fight? What does BJ Penn think his path to victory is? I'd have to think it's probably to keep the fight standing, because he definitely doesn't want Rory McDonald to take him down, because Rory will be able to impose his will, and will be able to definitely outstrike uh, BJ if he's, if he's got him on his back. So I gotta think maybe Penn wants to keep the fight standing? I'm not sure. Rory McDonald, 13-1 and one on his pro career, 4-1 and one in the UFC, currently riding a three-fight win streak over Che Mills, Mike Pyle, and Nate Diaz, who's fighting for the, well, for the, uh, for the lightweight title on this same card. Uh, his only career loss was to Carlos Condit in 2010. Uh, former King of the Cage lightweight and Canadian lightweight champion, uh, 12 of his 13 have been finishes. His wins, by the way, six knockouts, six submissions. So he's he's a well-rounded guy. His striking is kind of only 50-50 in terms of the actual strikes that he lands, but he's got great takedown defense, and he hits about 60% of his takedowns. Penn's got to worry about that. Penn definitely has to worry about Rory McDonald's takedown abilities, and I hope he's been working that uh, either his takedown defense or to get those counter knees in there when, uh, when Rory goes to shoot. Ultimately, I think eventually Rory is going to catch him in a couple of takedowns, is going to take him down. I mean, BJ's, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, BJ's BJJ uh, is, is great. I mean, it's again, it's the Nova Uniao camp, descendant of Carlson Gracie is the guy that he's got his black belt under. So he could submit McDonald. I think I gotta go with the young the young gun in this fight. Uh, I hate to sleep on BJ Penn. Uh, I don't like to do it because I slept on BJ Penn in the Matt Hughes fight, and that did not go well for me. Um, but I think I'm gonna have to take Rory McDonald in this fight. I'll take it by unanimous judges' decision, and depending how Penn looks in this fight, that's probably gonna be the end of the road. But again, if it is B, uh, BJ, is a first ballot Hall of Famer. There's no question in my mind about that that BJ Penn if he's not already in the Hall of Fame I can't recall the Hall of Fame fighters right away if he's not already in the Hall of Fame he's a definite Hall of Fame fighter we're going to move up to the light heavyweight division a pivotal matchup at 205 Mauricio Shogun Hua coming in to face Alexander Gustafson and this is going to be a phenomenal fight don't do not kid yourself. Uh, Gustafson is a great fighter, and Shogun is in war after war after war. This is going to be a great fight from start to finish. Shogun, 21 and 6 on his pro career, 5 and 4 in the UFC. He came into the UFC as a 16 and 2 dynamo. You know what I mean? Obviously, pride legend. Um, I, I love I love me some Shogun. TKO'd Brandon Vera in his last fight in what was probably a better fight than it should have been with Brandon Vera on the other end. And again, he's just he's got a propensity to be in exciting as hell fights. So you, you never want to miss a Shogun Hua fight. 
Uh, BJJ Black Belt under Nino Shembri. Uh, his takedown and his striking defense is kind of suspect. Uh, he only stuffs about one in four takedowns against him, and less than 50% uh, of incoming strikes are avoided too but Shogun is just Shogun is a warrior in every sense of the word you gotta wonder at what point that warrior pedigree is, is gonna start catching up to him and against a guy like Gustafson you know it absolutely could Alexander Gustafson, 14 and 1 on his pro career. He is 6 and 1 in the UFC, a great UFC record. Currently riding a five-fight win streak. We look at Tiago Silva, Vladimir Matyushenko, Matt Hamill, James Tahuna, and Cyril Diabati. He has got some legit good wins in there. Uh, the Silva fight was his first and only decision victory on his career. Nine of his 14 pro wins have come by way of knockout. He is a BJJ Purple Belt training with Alliance MMA. He throws a lot of strikes, but he only hits about one in three. He's only about 33%, but he's got really good takedown defense. He's not going to have to worry about his takedown defense in this fight. I doubt Shogun is going to go for a lot of takedowns. But then again, I didn't think he would really go for takedowns in the Machida fight, and he, or, or in the fight against Jones, but he, he kind of did. But uh, again, I don't think uh, Gustafson's takedown defense is really going to come in much into play here. Uh, Shogun is going to want to strike, 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 and clinch, 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 and strike, 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 and get knees in there. And uh, Gustafson, again, to his credit, Gustafson is a damn good fighter. You know where this is going. I can't bet against Shogun. What are you talking You're asking me to bet against BJ Penn and Shogun Hua on the same card, and I'm just not going to do that. So... I gotta, I gotta go with Hua. I gotta go with Shogun to beat Gustafson by knockout or technical knockout inside the third round in what is going to be an exciting as balls fight right up to the finish and including the finish. Uh, you know what? Shogun is one of my absolute favorite fighters of all time, and that's easy to say because he's, he's on, a, he's on an awful lot of lists. But definitely got to take Shogun to beat Gustafson by third round knockout or TKO. It's time! Lightweight Championship, Ben Smooth Henderson with his second title defense going up against Stockton 209. What? Nate Diaz. I'm so pumped for this fight. Ben Henderson, 17-2 and in his pro career, unbeaten 5-0 and in the UFC, currently riding a five-decision win streak. Two over Frankie Edgar, Clay Guida, Jim Miller, and Mark Bocek. Very good fighters, all of them. Ten of his 17 pro wins have been finishes. He's got four knockouts and six submissions. Seven and one when the fight goes the distance. Very well-rounded. Taekwondo black belt, BJJ brown belt, and he's an NAIA All-American wrestler. Note that that is not NCAA. He didn't go to an NCAA school. NAIA All-American wrestler. And very elusive. He avoids about 63% of incoming strikes. So, at worst, you're talking about landing only about 4 of every 10 strikes that you throw if you're fighting Ben Henderson. Nate Diaz, 16-7 and seven on his pro career, 11-5 and five in the UFC, very good record. Three fight win streaks, submission of Jim Miller, decision of Donald Cerrone, and a submission of Takanori Gomi. Five-time fight of the night and submission of the night winner. This guy has awards for days. BJJ black belt under, of course, Cesar Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. He can be taken down. His takedown defense is only around 50-50, so he can be taken down, but his BJJ is dangerous off his back. I, I remember there's always that vision of Nate Diaz locking up that triangle choke and then going like this because he knows he's got it. Uh, it's a very dangerous off his back. He is also elusive. Avoids also about six of every ten incoming strikes. And the big thing with Nate Diaz is he has got cardio for days. Nate and Nick both have amazing cardio, and that really can propel them to victories when their opponents kind of start wearing out. <sighs> you know what? I'm going to be a total homer. You know what? Hate on it if you want. I'm going to be a total homer here. Uh, you may want to just disregard this fight prediction completely. Nate Diaz defeats Ben Henderson, and claims the UFC lightweight championship. Stockton 209 what? 
Nate Diaz defeats Ben Henderson by five round unanimous judges decision. Nate Diaz is your new UFC lightweight champion. That's the card for you folks. I'm going to go over my predictions with you one more time. On the undercard, lightweight, I've got Tim Means knocking out or TKOing Abel Triillo in the second round. I have Scott Jorgensen knocking out or TKOing John Albert in the third round. Henry Martinez decisioning Darren Cruikshank. I've got Jeremy Stevens decisioning Eve Edwards. I've got Ramsey Nijem decisioning Joe Proctor. I've got Dennis Seaver decisioning Nam Fan. And I have Mike Easton decisioning Rafael Asuncao. On the main card, I've got Mike Swick decisioning Matt Brown. At welterweight, I've got Rory McDonald, unfortunately, decisioning BJ Penn. At light heavyweight, I have Shogun Hua to knock out or TKO Alexander Gustafson in the third round. And the main event of the evening, lightweight championship, I have Nate Diaz decisioning Ben Henderson after five rounds and claiming the UFC lightweight championship. Those are my fight predictions. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing in the paper kind of failed there. Want to hear your fight predictions in the comments section below. I understand I'm being a homer with the Diaz pick, but Stockton 209 what? What are you going to do? All right. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. Watch the fights tomorrow night. It's a free fight card. It's a great fight card, top to bottom, really good undercard fights. We'll see you at the fights and enjoy them.